Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, welcome to our uh, spring seminar series for another fabulous talk by one of our speakers. My name is Yvonne Valencourt and I'm the director of the Nantucket Field Station. We are a facility of UMass Boston. We're managed by the School for the Environment and we sit on over a hundred acres of conservation land uh, and open space that is owned by the Nantucket Conservation Foundation. Um, before we launch into our talk introduction, I'd like to point out a couple of things. One is we have a, a question and answer uh, button on the bottom of your Zoom screen. So if you have a question or comment, please use that. We will um, take questions and answers at the, um, at the end of the talk. And if you would um, write them in there as they come up, they can be addressed in that fashion. Um, you can also use the hand wave function if you'd like to uh, directly ask or comment um, as we tend to have some discussion get sparked at the end. Uh, that will be facilitated by um, a third party, Leo uh, Stella, who will be, um, well, you'll, you'll see at that point. Um, and as I was saying, uh, the other thing I'd like to point out is um, our speaker tonight uh, was, is Greg Whitmore, and we're thrilled that he's here with us. Um, I'd like to say something about uh, his funding source, which is a group that we are a, a proud member of. The Nantucket Biodiversity Initiative is the organization that funded Greg's work. And I would just like to uh, share my screen for a second and show you our website. Um, we are a group of uh, people made up from different agencies and organizations on the island of Nantucket. Um, as you can see, we have a great website and you should check it out if you're not familiar with it. Um, Nantucket Biodiversity Initiative does a number of things, one of which is give out small grants for research to come to Nantucket and to help us to better understand our uh, Nantucket biodiversity. Um, these are some of the groups, if you scroll down on the website, that are members of this initiative. And um, it's made up of also some individuals. And um, we have a lot of information on our website, so I won't take up time uh, with that this evening, but you should definitely check it out. We, like I said, hand out small grants. We also have a conference every other year and a science showcase, which is a citizen science event. And um, though I could keep on talking about NBI because it's a great group of people um, and we do a lot on this island, um, I would like to now introduce our speaker and stop sharing my screen. Um, everyone, please welcome Greg Whitmore and I will just turn it right over to Greg. Hi everyone, uh, you know, thanks for having me on tonight. So it's great to be able to share uh, my research to especially a local audience. Um, and this is really the culmination of uh, the last 10 years of, and well, actually, I guess the last 13 years of first thinking about this project for a while, and then, uh, you know, finally being able to do it. So, um, you know, hopefully everybody uh, has a really good experience tonight and learned something and, uh, you know, I'm excited to be here. So what I'm going to do is just uh, share my own slideshow and I'll do a bit of an introduction of who I am and what I've been doing over the last you know, 20 years of research or so. All right, so the project is entitled The Macroinvertebrate Fauna of Nantucket's Perennial and Ephemeral Streams. And before you get started, wait a minute, Nantucket has streams? It absolutely does, I promise. There are some out there. I wasn't sure myself for a while, but uh, sure enough, they're there. So who am I? Um, so I am a teacher. I live up in Deerfield, New Hampshire. Uh, I am currently employed at a high school called Pembroke Academy, where I teach upper level sciences. Uh, and I'm almost an, also an adjunct professor at Southern New Hampshire University. So I got a bachelor's in biology from Franklin Pierce. Back then it was Franklin Pierce College. Now it's Franklin Pierce University in 2000. And then I went to UNH for my graduate degree in zoology um, in 2004. 
So my research focus since then uh, has been largely aquatic biomonitoring, and I'll get into what that entails as we go through the presentation. Um, I do a, 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 most of my research is done in also in a macroinvertebrate taxonomy. Uh, I'm actually an ephemeroptera specialist and ephem ephemeroptera are mayflies. Um, but I've been since getting into all of the other groups, uh, as you'll see. As far as my study areas, uh, I started out doing work in New Hampshire and that's how I uh, started working with the mayflies. So I did, for example, the mayfly fauna of New Hampshire, which was largely unknown. Uh, I moved down to Martha's Vineyard in 2006 and lived down there for a few years. And while I lived there, I worked for the trustees of reservations as the Southeastern Regional Ecologist. And this is what allowed me to get my foot into uh, conducting research down on the vineyard and Cape Cod. Uh, so I did the uh, macroinvertebrate fauna of Martha's Vineyard. Um, as well as some Cape Cod sites. And interestingly enough, that's what led me to this project on Nantucket. So I was introduced to Nantucket in general uh, because the trustees had some properties out there. And most notably, I would head out to Great Point on occasion and uh, work with the seals and the birds. Um, while I was on the vineyard, I was actually, I'm not, honestly, at this point, I'm not even sure how I, how it came up. I, I feel like something just showed up in the mail and it talked about this conference, the Nantucket Biodiversity Initiative Research Conference. And I said, you know what, I've got something to talk about. Why not uh, present my data and, you know, see what happens. So I went out to Nantucket for the night and uh, gave my talk and it was a great experience. And while I was there, someone asked would I like to lead a field trip to a place called Squam Swamp, which I'm sure all of you know very well. And I said, absolutely. And someone said, you know, there's, there's some flowing water out there. And I said, really? Because I'd always been under the impression that flowing water, particularly flowing fresh water, um, was virtually non-existent on Nantucket. Uh, so I was, you know, delighted to, to try it. Sure, absolutely. I'll go out there and, you know, see if we can find anything and, you know, dip in a net and see what happens. So I found myself going through the forest, leading a small group of brave explorers behind me. And uh, we came upon Squam Stream and I said, wow, it, it, it's, it's true. It, it does exist. There's a beautiful little flowing freshwater stream out here. Um, so I put my net in the water, I, I did my thing, and I, I pulled out some of the mucky stuff that, uh, you know, is on the stream bottom, which I'll, I'll show you some nice pictures of later on, and uh, put this material in my pan and waited to see something walking around in there. And sure enough, what wandered out was something that I, well, probably the last thing I thought would have shown up in there, which was a stonefly. So a stonefly, along with pretty much all of the groups of invertebrates that I'm going to talk about um, is something that starts out in a larval form uh, living in freshwater and it undergoes this transformation as it, as it grows and turns into a flying adult whose only purpose is to mate and then sadly die. Um, and this particular type of stonefly, this particular genus of stonefly is one that I had only encountered in the purest, coldest, cleanest water, something you would really associate with like mountain streams or just, uh, you know, real tiny first order, fast flowing clean waters. Uh, so it, 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 it was shocking. You know, I, there, there wasn't much else in the stream, but this little stonefly really stuck. So 10 years passed by. And, uh, you know, every so often I would think about that stone flying, think, you know, I should really get back out there and design a project and, uh, you know, really look into it, you know. Uh, so I started looking for money because you got to get there somehow. I don't know if you noticed, but Nantucket is a rather expensive place to get to. So a bit of sleuthing and I came up with the Nantucket Biodiversity Initiative Small Research Grants Program. Uh, submitted a proposal and it was approved and the rest is history. So let's take a look and see where this project took me. All right, so freshwater streams on Nantucket, yes, like I said, they're there, but they're very small. So small, 
uh, I would say that they mostly go, un go unnoticed. And many of them are actually intermittent in that uh, they only flow for, um, from my experience, uh, nine, 10 months out of the year. And uh, you know, some of them absolutely uh, likely have a yearly dry cycle, unless you have uh, <clears throat> you know, a pretty exceptional year where you get a, a very large amount of rainfall. So of all the research I was doing for this project, I came up with this quote that just summed it up perfectly. Uh, this is out of 1964 by Chamberlain, described streams on Nantucket as small, weak, and rare. And yes, the, absolutely. So the few streams that are present are found in areas that have clay deposits underneath. So the geology of Nantucket is amazingly complex. When you actually look at what's going on under the surface, it's this incredible composite of different types of sand and glacial material. Uh, <clears throat> but some areas you have clay and clay is excellent at keeping water from percolating through. So those are the areas where you tend to have these very small uh, streams. And they do seem to be more prevalent on the eastern side of Nantucket. And when I show you my map, you'll notice that they're certainly clustered in a particular area. So <clears throat> is the project worth doing? You know, has anyone ever looked? Now, I'm very interested in islands. Islands are fascinating to me because islands represent isolation. And isolation represents change. It represents <clears throat> species that are subjected to different conditions that organisms on the mainland are not. And because of that, we can get some completely unique ecosystems forming. Uh, let's see. There are no published records of freshwater stream macroinvertebrates on Nantucket. All right, it's completely new ground. <clears throat> so there was a four-year study in 1930 by Johnson and Emerton. Uh, they did provide a list of insects and spiders from Nantucket, and there were some aquatic groups. Uh, they did not get into a lot of detail, to say the least, as far as how things were collected or specifically where or whatnot. Uh, but it everything on the uh everything on their um list was either terrestrial or it was coming out of lakes or ponds or swamps or whatnot and then in 2002 Alberti and chandler um did a four-day sampling period of aquatic invertebrates yeah, but again they were only sampling standing water environments so no flowing water environments so enter me let's let's fill in the gaps and see what's living in there <clears throat> All right, so the freshwater streams on Nantucket are very small, first order streams, which means they are literally emerging from the ground, either from springs um, or from just, you know, basically they're either spring, uh, spring seeps or they're rainwater fed. Um, some of them are flowing out of ponds just as overflow, uh, but they're, you know, all very tiny. Because of their size, the habitat that they offer is going to be extremely limited. Uh, you know, the larger the habitat, the more opportunity there is for a variety of uh, different microhabitats to exist. But the smaller it is, I mean, you get what you get. <clears throat> so it was hypothesized that diversity and abundance would be limited due to stream size. Also land use history. Now, the land use history of Nantucket is tough. So I cannot, uh, for the life of me, come up with a definite consensus as to how heavily Nantucket was forested in the past. So some people say, yes, you know, we have these historic tales of people showing up and the island was just covered with these massive oaks and hickories and whatnot. Um, and then other authors will say, no, that's absolutely not the case. Uh, you know, they couldn't possibly exist due to its location, due to the wind and whatnot. So it's tough to really come up with that history. Um, Nantucket itself, uh, you know, most of the population is clumped into kind of the center of the island. And as you move away, there's this incredible swaths of conservation land. But we certainly know that most of the island was utilized in the past for sheep. And sheep are very destructive, to say the least. Uh, they, they, they do a lot of damage to the environment. Uh, so Nantucket has had a rather similar history to the rest of New England, where if there was forested, that forest was cut down. And what we have remaining on Nantucket are just vestiges of somewhat recent forest, you know, reforestation. Um, we had, you know, a large amount of sheep present, just like the rest of New England. So, you know, uh, humans have had their impact, to say the least. And of course, isolation from the mainland. So <clears throat> how did all these organisms get to Nantucket? Well, 
they were there prior to sea level rise. So at the end of the last glaciation, you could walk from you know, anywhere in New England straight to Nantucket. It was one you know, uh, continuous landmass. But as the glaciers melted and the ocean level filled in, uh, Nantucket became isolated. So, you know, six, seven thousand years ago, give or take, was probably the end point uh, for it being connected to the vineyard or to the Cape. Uh, so <clears throat> that is when the clock started ticking. Now, how can organisms get there today? Well, you got to think of the groups we're questioning. So, you know, if we're talking about large mammals or birds, you know, birds can fly back and forth. Um, some mammals can make their way across. It's, it's possible, it's, you know, it's not, not, not uh, likely, but possible. Um, insects, particularly a number of the ones I'm going to discuss, a dragonfly could fly from the Cape to Nantucket no problem. A beetle could do it, but something like a mayfly, a stonefly, a caddisfly, they would find that distance virtually impossible. Um, we could have storm-assisted dispersal, where you know, a good thunderstorm, something whips up and can just blow creatures from Cape Cod, uh, you know, through the through the air over to Nantucket. Certainly, a lot of insects could travel that way. Um, how about ferry boats? Right, we have ferry boats going back and forth between Nantucket and the mainland, um, and big lights on them. We know big lights attract a lot of insects, so that's another way stuff could be transported across. Uh, but, you know, I was very anxious to see what I would find. My first trip to the island, the first sample was at the UMass, Boston, uh, or at the, uh, UMass field station site. And I'll tell you, I was thrilled to look into that pan and see something look it back at me. You know, it kind of confirmed all those couple years of planning. So the sites, let's see, stream sampling began in May of 2018 and concluded in April of 2019. So I like to do year-long studies uh, because it tells me when organisms are present. Um, a lot of these groups, you will only find the larvae in the water for short periods of time, sometimes just a few months. Um, they hatch from an egg, they grow up very quickly, they emerge, they turn into adults, they fly away. So you really need to be doing it um, monthly, you know, over the course of a year. So you get the full picture. Uh, I came up with six sites and the sites were all chosen based on a couple reasons. Number one, they needed to be accessible to me. So anything on private property was, I ruled that out very quickly because it just seems to be uh, very difficult uh, to track down a lot of owners of property or get permissions or whatnot. So everything I had chose was actually on conservation land, which made it a lot easier. Uh, I also wanted to make sure that I was dealing with fresh water because there is a saltwater fauna or a brackish water fauna and that is not my area of expertise whatsoever. I'm a freshwater guy. So I had to make sure that the salinity levels were correct. Um, the sites were typically clustered in the northeast. There was a southeastern site in a single northwestern site. And here they are. So we can see in the top right corner, we have Squam Brook, we have Madui Creek, we have the Pulpus Road site, the UMass Field Station site, Phillips Run, and then over on the western side of the island, we have Millbrook Road. So there are large portions of the island that are not represented, but there's a reason for that, and that they're either just were not suitable sites, uh, meaning that there just weren't really freshwater streams there. Um, if there were, you know, any flowing water, it had a higher salinity or whatnot. Um, there were a couple instances, sites where I might have liked to have gotten into, but, um, you know, just accessibility would have been uh, too difficult to do. Uh, but this is a good representation of the island, uh, and Nantucket's not very big. Uh, so, in reality, any organism that's in any of these streams, uh, could essentially, you know, fly to another site if it felt the need. Um, that usually isn't the case. Macroinvertebrates like to grow up in a particular body of water. They emerge from that body of water, they mate, and they tend to lay their eggs in the same body of water. Yes, they certainly can disperse sometimes, um, but what I've noticed is that even very closely, um, you know, closely situated sites can have a very different fauna. All right, so let's just take a look at the sites individually. And I'm sure if you're from the island, you will recognize uh, quite a few of these. 
So here we have Squam Brook, the site that started it all, the very site actually, this, this exact location. So we're located in Squam Swamp. Um, now, I have certainly uh, made note of the perennial sites versus the ephemeral sites. So the perennial sites are those sites in which the water is flowing year round um, and it provides stability uh, for the fauna. So basically the organisms that are found in a perennial site are ones that likely, you know, not always, but many of them could not exist in an ephemeral site, one that will dry up. And on the flip side, there are a number of organisms um, that are found in the ephemeral sites of, of Nantucket that only exist in those sites. You will not find them in these year-round bodies of water, which is very interesting, um, but they're just different life strategies and they have their pros and cons. Discharge in any of these sites is I mean, these are absolutely tiny, tiny bodies of water. So looking at Squam Brook right now, it looks like a decent sized stream, but the reason it has such a small discharge is because the water is just absolutely barely moving. There's always the slightest amount of flow traveling through Squam Swamp. Now, uh, I always go through and take a look at the stream bottom composition. Uh, it is something very important because the bottom composition uh, tells me what sort of habitat that I have. So on Nantucket, we have mucky bottom, quite a bit of mucky bottom, which is just uh, dissolved organic matter of various types. We have sandy bottoms. There's very, very little cobble and rock, almost none. Um, and there's a decent amount of uh, you know, sticks and leaves and whatnot. Some aquatic emergent plants will occur at some of the sites, but mostly what I see is mucky bottom. Uh, canopy cover is another important thing to note at all of these sites. In this case, there's about 90% canopy cover, which means if you were to look up, um, and you, you do this when the, everything is leafed out, uh, how much of the sky can you see? If you take a little window above your head, and in this case, about 90% of the sky is blocked by canopy. So this lends to how much shade are you actually getting on these streams, which will tell you how much sunlight is penetrating for primary production, or you might consider how much is that sunlight able to heat up the stream during the summer. All right. What I love about Squam Brook is there's little to no human alteration of this site whatsoever. You walk around and you just feel like you're in the wilderness. It's a beautiful, you know, nice quiet spot in Nantucket and uh, it's just a healthy ecosystem. Now, one thing pretty much every site has in common is tannin. So tannin is an acid that naturally leaches out of plant material that falls into the water and it gives it this, this uh, tea stained or uh, you know, dark brownish color to the water. And the sites on Nantucket have varying degrees of tannin. Squam Brook has a lot. So it really obscures the, um, how, you know, how well you can see into the water and just, you know, it's, uh, it's very dark to say the least. All right, here we have Itty Bitty Medui Creek. So it's located along the Dewey Creek Road. This particular site abuts the Trustees of Reservations uh, uh, field house. So it is an ephemeral site, which meant it went dry for about three months, uh, very tiny discharge, 100% mucky stream bottom, and very much you know, uh, covered, 90% canopy cover. This site did have a bit of trash on the bank, just solid waste. Um, strangely enough, on one of the trips, I found a whale rib, a full whale rib, just sitting on the bank of this stream, and I couldn't possibly tell you why it was there. Uh, it got there somehow. Uh, and again, quite a bit of tannin at this site. Here we have Phillips Run. Now, Phillips Run is a monster stream compared to every other site. It's seven times, you know, uh, uh, discharge of the other sites in general. And again, it's pretty tiny. I mean, you're talking about water, it comes up to my shins, maybe seven or eight feet across. Uh, and even though it's the largest stream that I sampled, it is an ephemeral site. So this did dry up for a while. So it's located along Milestone Road. It actually does cut into the road just uh, south of where we we're sampling. This site had a very different bottom and that is mostly sandy uh, and had quite a bit of aquatic grass. No canopy cover whatsoever. And uh, that was actually very interesting because the highest temperature recorded actually came out of Phillips Run because of that lack of trees. Now, Phillips Run is downstream from a cranberry bog and uh, the water was a bit clearer than the other sites. The Millbrook Road site. Now, one thing you are going to notice in the next couple is that I'm calling it the Millbrook Road site. 
So this one and the next two sites, I could not track down the exact name of these streams. Every map I looked at said something slightly different. Uh, so I decided to play it safe and just describe it. I am absolutely certain that someone in the audience probably knows the exact name of all of these. And I wish I had met you a year or so ago so I could know the exact sites of these, but this was, this was the best I could come up with for this. So it is located along Millbrook Road. Um, this is a perennial site. Discharge could not be taken. Um, I, on the date when I took all the discharge, there was not measurable flow at this site, which was unfortunate. Uh, but as you know, volume wise, discharge wise, I'm, it was very much in line with all of the other sites. It was 100% mucky stream bottom, fair amount of canopy cover. It definitely, if you look at the map, it's been channelized. Um, it's not a natural stream course to say the least. Uh, a huge infestation of Japanese knotweed, which made it really difficult and oftentimes painful to get down into the site because you had to break through the stuff to get to the water. Uh, it had a higher degree of tannin and there was a TV floating in it. It looked like it was from the mid eighties or so. It wasn't my TV, so I didn't want to take it with me. So I'm, it may still be floating there right now. The UMass Field Station site, itty bitty, tiny, tiny little stream but actually a really cool little environment. Uh, so it is an ephemeral stream. It did dry up, uh, dry up for a while. It had a combination sand and muck stream bottom. Um, and it was the only site where I actually noted freshwater, uh, freshwater sponges underneath the few cobbles um, that I could find right here. 100% canopy cover. It was actually sampled. This is uh, what we're looking at these two rocks. There's a culvert right there. So it was just downstream of the culvert. Very high amount of tannin in there. And the Pulpus Road site. Located along Pulpus Road, had to jump over this fence and down the embankment to get down there. Um, this was a perennial site. About Mm, three or four times the size of most of the other streams. Um, so it was second largest as far as discharge is concerned. Now, the stream bottom here, it was actually interesting. It was a very different site. So it was mostly sand and pebble and a few cobbles. Uh, and as you can see, quite a bit of aquatic plants. So what we're seeing is a very large wetland complex that is beginning to channelize and drain at this point. So it was actually a perfect point for sampling because um, everything was just converging right at this bridge. No canopy cover whatsoever, but that didn't seem to have the same impact here as it did at Phillips Run, likely just because of the, you know, the, the grass that we're seeing uh, provided a fair amount of shade. So it is downstream from a retired cranberry bog, um, and the water here was actually surprisingly clear, very low tannin. All right, so how do we do this? Let's see, the sites are sampled and stream chemistry is taken on a monthly basis. I mean, as close as possible. Um, it wasn't exact because, you know, as far as just getting to the island um, can be difficult sometimes. So it was as close as possible. I used two different sorts of nets. One is a D-frame dip net, which just looks like a giant net that you would use to clean out a fish tank, say. Um, and a kick net. And I'll have images of both of these as we come up. Um, and really what I'm shooting for when I'm sampling is two minute intervals. So I will take this giant D-frame net and I will sweep the bottom of the stream bed. I will flip over any rocks. I will, um, you know, kind of rub my hands along sticks uh, above the net, get underneath stream banks, um, uh, drag it through any sort of aquatic vegetation. I'm trying to sample as many of the different microhabitats in the stream as possible. Actually, I'm trying to sample all of the microhabitats in the stream uh, while still trying to maintain this two minute interval. Um, and the reason you want to time it is that so you can have some sort of comparison value. Um, if you want to run some sort of statistical analysis when you're done, as far as population studies, then you do need to standardize how much, you know, how long you're actually sampling for. Uh, same thing with the, the uh, kick net, you want to, see, you know, I'm, I'm kicking for two minute intervals. What I'm left with is this net full of mucky material. And I take this and I throw it into a pan and I sort through it and uh, see what's in there. And I preserve everything in 70% ethanol, which quickly kills and preserves any organisms in the sample. And then over an excruciating long period of time, I will identify them. And it usually takes me about a year after a study of this size uh, to make my way through all of the uh, material. 
I, I go for uh, species, if at all possible. There are some groups where species level keys just don't exist, and that's fine. They can get them down to genus level. So here are some images from the project. So this is a kick net being used. So that is Katie doing the kicking. Uh, and that is me standing in the background there holding the kick net. So it's a very simple um, net. It's just a large piece of rectangular mesh, um, very small diameter holes in it, um, two, you know, two rods of wood on the side. And individual will literally kick the bottom of the stream. They'll kick over rocks. They'll disturb it with their feet. What they're doing is they're freeing up everything on the bottom, which then gets swept down and trapped in the kick net. This is me sweeping the bottom with a dip net. You can't quite see it, but I promise it's down there. Um, so I will sweep through the vegetation in this case, sweep along the bottom. And again, trying to sample any potential uh, tiny habitat that exists in this stream. And this is the result. So you get a whole net full of interesting looking material. And I'm just hoping, hoping, hoping I can see something moving around. If I get a sample where I'm not thrilled, I will redo it. Uh, you know, if I don't see much uh, you know, much moving around, uh, then, you know, I'll say, hey, maybe I just sampled, uh, you know, a particularly, um, you know, or not a great section of stream. Could I try it again? And I may have replicate samples before I get something I'm really happy with. And then you transfer all that material into a pan and you just see what you have. So you're saying, okay, are we getting representative groups? Um, you know, and it's, it's good to see these things moving, um, you know, particularly uh, it, it helps, you know, with, having them, you know, so, I mean, sometimes things could get damaged in the collecting jars. How's that? And, uh, you know, seeing them in the pan reminds me, oh, I have to pay particular attention when I'm sorting to make sure that I pick out all the mayflies or stoneflies because they're really tiny. So it always helps to uh, see them live in the pan. And plus, it's really interesting just to see these things as they are. Um, you can see to the right, I have that little jar there. That is one of the sample jars. So this is the end result. Uh, and you have these jars of mucky material with preserved invertebrates. You bring them back to the lab and you sort through them. I actually pull out everything. I usually don't subsample um, because I'm trying to get a complete picture. And if you subsample, you can miss rare species. And that's the last thing I want to do. I'm trying to build a list for Nantucket. And uh, the only time I will subsample is, uh, and especially for this study, there were instances where I would get, say, 500 of one particular species. And if that's the case, I will not take all of those out of the sample. I'll just take a certain amount and then note how many there actually were in there. The results. All right. So the island of Nantucket currently has 58 species of macroinvertebrates that live in the stream and another 12 groups that could only be identified to genus level. So could there be potentially 70 different species? Yes. The issue with that is that of these 12, several of them are beetle larvae that can only be identified to the genus level because keys to the species level don't exist. Now, I have adults in the same genus, sometimes from the same sites. So they're likely just the larvae associated with those adults. But can I conclusively say that? No, because I just can't identify them to that level. So I'm just erring on the side of safety and just putting them at genus level and saying, you know, uh, we just have these 58 species in 12 genus level identifications. Uh, it's not a complete look. Uh, I specialize in certain groups and there are other groups that I just uh, don't work with at this point. So for example, midges, which are coronamids, um, midges are their own study in themselves. So I have not tackled the midges. I did collect midges, but they were not included in this study. Also leeches and snails and aquatic worms. Oftentimes these groups have to be worked with live in order to identify them and just logistics, I, that's not something I could do. I could not transport live specimens of these in any ways and you know, be able to work with them. So I'm looking mostly at insects and a few species of crustaceans. Now, overall, this is pretty low abundance what I saw. So for you know, the groups that I found, there were never a lot of most of them. There are actually 14 species from that list for which a single specimen was collected. And that's it. In an entire year, I was only able to collect a single 
individual of 14 of these species. And the abundance on many other of them it was also quite low. This makes sense though, when we look at the size of the streams, you're just not going to have a lot of life in them. You know, the habitat is just not there. So that's fine. Um, overall abundance, when we look at the total numbers, overall abundance was dominated by just a few species. So the breakdown from the six sites, we look at Squam Brook, there were 16 groups that were identified to species level, and there were six unique to the site. And that's a very important part of this study in that uh, almost all of these sites, there's one exception, uh, there are species that currently exist only in those sites, right? Now, future sampling in, you know, different streams may, will hopefully show otherwise, but that really kind of puts into perspective uh, the fragile nature of these streams in that if something were to happen to a particular stream, you could essentially lose species. Uh, Madui Creek, there were four groups identified to species level and five that could only be identified to genus. Phillips Run was the winner by far. 37 groups identified to species level. 27 of those are unique to Phillips Run. So if you're talking about you know, biodiversity, uh, Phillips Run is the way to go. It's amazing. Five, uh, let's see, Millbrook Road site, 12 uh, groups identified to species. Uh, one unique to the site, one group to genus level, the UMass Field Station site, 10 species, three unique to that site, and four groups identified to genus level, and Pulpus Road, uh, 13 groups, three unique to the site, and five genus level. I also do water quality. I mean, why not? We're there. It gives you the complete picture, right? Now, there was an incredibly expensive meter uh, that you, uh, the UMass Field Station had that I dared not touch. Uh, luckily, there was always someone uh, that came along with me and that knew how to use it much better than I. And so I did not want to be the one to accidentally do something horrible to the meter. Um, but it was a fantastic piece of equipment. And I'm very thankful uh, that the UMass Field Station was uh, there to uh, provide it. Uh, because it gives a huge range of water quality measurements. And uh, what was found is that stream chemistry measurements really fell within expected ranges for developed areas. We don't, I mean, it, it's interesting to say developed areas in regards to Nantucket, but I mean, it, it is developed. You know, you have just the existence of roads means it's developed. You know, we're not talking like a, obviously a huge city, but you know, having small towns and houses and roads, that is development and that is going to affect water quality. So temperature, conductivity, salinity, pH, dissolved oxygen, these are the big ones that I really tend to focus on. And there's just a few things that I wanted to mention. So for example, pH. Uh, the average pH for the sites was quite acidic, which is expected. When you have that amount of tannin, and tannin is a naturally occurring acid, you're going to have rather low pH readings. The lowest recording was 3.46, and that's really getting down there. And I was at the Neotechic Field Station site. The highest value, strangely enough, is at uh, 7.32, which was surprisingly high. Um, honestly, I didn't expect to find anything north of 7 on Nantucket, but that was um, kind of an outlier. So most of the streams are dark brown. And again, this large amount of tannin present, this is what's contributing to low pH overall. Dissolved oxygen is absolutely key. If you're an organism living in the water, you have gills, you have to breathe, you really care about how much dissolved oxygen's in there. Phillips Run exhibited the highest DO levels, which is typical or faster water. As water flows, particularly faster water, it mixes with the atmosphere, with the oxygen, and a lot of that gets mixed in. Squam Brook exhibited the lowest, which is very typical of swampy areas. And DO definitely appears to be a limiting factor in most streams. As streams warm up, DO drops, and uh, as flow, you know, as the flow um, slows down, DO level also drops. Organisms need to breathe, and if they can't take it, they die off. Now, isopods, sow bugs, one species on the island, Cicadodia communis. Now, this is the dominant species on Nantucket by far. Nothing else comes close. It was collected at every site in high abundance. 64% of everything I collected was a sow bug. 
this this one species. And this is shocking, you know, shocking abundance. On numerous occasions, there were several hundred individuals. I think the most was 500 individuals from a single sample. And just to put into perspective, 95% of the specimens overall from Squam Stream were this one species. So uh, it was amazing how common it was. And the question is why? I have not seen anything like this anywhere throughout my study sites. So for example, on Martha's Vineyard, I did a study on you know, the vineyard in Cape Cod, um, very much lower abundance. The highest amount collected on Nantucket was 518, but from the vineyard, 19, and from Cape Cod, 10. Those are the most I ever got from a single sample. So what it comes down to after a lot of thought is that the dominance of this species is likely due to a lack of competition resulting from limited diversity. The stonefly that started it all, one species of stonefly was collected. Leuctra tenuous, collected in just one site, Squam Brook. It usually occurs in perennial and intermittent, intermittent streams. Uh, this genus of stonefly is particularly intolerant of organic pollution. It can't tolerate any sort of pollution whatsoever. If it's present, it just dies off. So it's considered an indicator species, an indicator of nice, clean, cool water. So it's present at Squam Brook shows that the brook has persisted in a natural state that is conducive to the continued existence of this pollution intolerant stonefly. It is a literal gem of the island. And it's very important that this is there uh, because it shows, I mean, if, if you have this present, it tells you right away that's, that's some great water there. There were two species of mayfly collected. Uh, Leptophlebia intermedia was collected at the Pulpus Road site and Calabetus floridanus from Phillips Run. Both species are associated with slower flowing sections of water and standing water. Now, ponds on the island uh, may contain populations of these species. I would actually expect them to. Leptophlebia intermedia is likely established in stump pond, um, which is kind of the starting point for the Pulpus Road sites. Uh, and it can make its way through these intermittent and perennial flows and end up at my sampling location. Now, Calabetus floridanus is very special. Um, it's known to occur in temporary or intermittent habitats, but it's really not supposed to occur anywhere near Nantucket. So its presence in Phillips Run um, is really interesting. Now, Mayflies are rather sensitive, so its presence in Phillips Run, which does dry out, indicates either an ability to persist in an intermittent stream or it's recolonizing from an upstream pond. Now, this study actually represents the first published record for this species in Massachusetts, uh, which is known to occur from Maryland west to Kansas, south of Florida and Texas. Now, doing this after a couple of years of research, I did come up with a record, an unpublished record, and I had to track it down. They're stored at UNH from West Groton, Mass, of a pair of adults, and I was able to confirm that. So, they were initially co collected in West Groton. I don't remember. I feel like it was in the last 20 years or so, uh, but this is important. So, uh, you know, the, the first published record of this, I mean, you're, you're talking about, you know, I mean, I, they didn't occur on the vineyard, they didn't occur on Cape Cod, and they haven't been found in the rest of Massachusetts. So it's interesting to say the least and uh, definitely needs to be looked into more. Trichoptera, another sensitive group. Caddisflies, here we see one living in its uh, case that they build out of little sticks and twigs and they carry around as almost a protection or camouflage. And when they emerge, they turn into something that looks kind of like a moth. They were collected from each site. The abundance was low, consisting mainly of case building caddisflies. Most of them are what was expected from a particular family, uh, limnophility, which occurs in a variety of flowing and standing water habitats. Coleoptera were the winners as far as species diversity, 23 species. 50% of all the species recorded in the island were beetles. They came from two particular groups, mostly diving beetles and water scavenger beetles. Um, what was interesting is that it was actually a much more diverse fauna and a completely different suite of species than what was showing up on the vineyard, which is the best really comparison for Nantucket. Uh, but the habitats on Nantucket are very different, small, slow, dark, and these are very conducive to beetles, which is why they're doing so well. 
Hemipter are the true bugs, back swimmers, water boatmen, water striders, giant water bugs. Uh, 11 species of these were collected, and these are all things that are very commonly found in lotic and lentic environments. The megalopter, the dobson flies, I didn't have a ton to say about them, I'm sorry, just this one sentence. I found them in four sites that were very limited in abundance, uh, and it's really about it for them. The damselflies and dragonflies. People love damselflies and dragonflies. They're very, very well documented on Nantucket, so I really wasn't expecting any surprises, and I didn't get any surprises, but I did get one that was incredibly common. Um, and it was also interesting to see that they only came from Phillips Run. No other site had any larvae whatsoever. So this one particular species, Neolini irene, was extremely abundant. 95% of all of the damselflies and dragonflies were this one particular species. And almost all of the larvae were collected from October to December. Amphipods, two species. Uh, these are tiny little shrimp, about a quarter of an inch or so in size. Again, only from Phillips Run. This particular one right here, Hyalela Azteca, was abundant throughout the year. And I was actually really surprised that amphipods were not collected from other sites. Uh, for example, back here in New Hampshire, any body of water anywhere, standing, flowing, even little vernal pools, puddles here and there, have amphipods. Same thing on you know mainland mass, even on the vineyard. I mean, they're just so abundant and so common it was really odd and surprising that they were limited just to Phillips Run. Dipter of the flies, three species. You do have black flies on Nantucket. I didn't think there were black flies, but there were. There's not a lot of them. You're lucky. Uh, we're in peak black fly season right here in New Hampshire. Uh, but there were just a few sites, the Pobles Road site and UMass Field Station site. And the only reason they were there, and this actually just occurred to me as I thought about it over the last month or so, is because those are the only two sites that had any amount of gravel and cobble. And they, these larvae, they're basically little maggots and they attach to rock. And if the rock isn't present, then the larvae are not present. So they owe their presence on the island to just these small microhabitats where you have that bit of rock and cobble to hold on to. Fish, where did those come from? I was not sampling fish, but they just came from somewhere. Inadvertently collected um, from a few sites. <clears throat> so sunfish and mummachogs came from the Millbrook Road site. I believe this is a pumpkin seed, but something's not quite right about it. Uh, it's either a pumpkin seed or a green sunfish, which look very similar at this stage. I'm guessing it's a pumpkin seed. It would make a lot more sense. And then elvers, which are immature eels, were collected from the Pulpus Road site. So this would be a very interesting research project, to say the least, particularly when trying to tie fish populations to macroinvertebrate populations and see what sort of impact they have on each other. All right, so if we try to analyze a bit of the data, I know I'm uh, starting to run out of time here, so I'm going to try and wrap this up. So as far as limiting factors, what's determining where organisms can live? Discharge is key. So ephemeral streams were dry during August and September. Dissolved oxygen levels slowly drop as the year progresses uh, and as temperature increases and discharge drops. And flow regimes. Some species cannot survive in ephemeral streams while others were only found in those sites. Now, I did run a Hilsenhoff Biotic Index, which is a way of looking at a body of water and what lives in there and making some statements about water quality. So what you do is you evaluate the amount of organic pollution in the stream by comparing species richness and abundance to existing data or similar sites. Species are assigned a tolerance value to each species, uh, which is the point at which a species is no longer able to survive due to increasing pollution. And these values range from zero to 10. So for example, low values would be species that are only found in the cleanest water. Mid value, moderate levels of pollution and high values. Species, I mean, these are species that could live in raw sewage and would be happy doing so. So I hope this text isn't too small. Um, Hills and Hot Biotic Index is generated for each site. Now, the results were odd. Um, and the results were odd because of this one species, uh, Cicadodia communis, the isopod. There were so many of them that the results were very much skewed. Now, C. communis can tolerate a lot of pollution. It has a very high tolerance value. And when you run the numbers through these formulas, it gives you this initial indication that the streams 
uh, may have rather poor water quality. And we can see down here, um, we have a first value with sea communists and the second without. So we look at Squam Stream, with sea communists, we have a value of 7.78 and without 3.67. We look to the right at the chart, and this is where we find out what those values mean. So value 7.78 would be very poor water quality. But if we take this one species, which dominates the fauna out of the equation, we have a value of 3.67, which is actually excellent water quality. Now, is it fair to take that species out? Well, we have to consider what else lives in the stream. This is the site that has a particular stonefly that, yes, that very pollution intolerant stonefly. So if it was indeed a polluted site, the stonefly could not exist, right? The only site on this list that I would be concerned about is Phillips Run because with Sea Communist and without, it still has a relatively high value. The other ones all fall within excellent to very good levels of water quality. Um, yeah, I just mentioned a few of these things. If we just skip down to the middle of this, Phillips Run um, in particular had three species which dominated fauna. Um, so it had the isopod, it had an amphipod, and it also had a damselfly, all of which had very high numbers of individuals uh, and these species all of high tolerance values. So those definitely could have skewed those numbers, but you know, it, I guess it's to be determined in the future. All right. On the flip side of this, however, there is a species of black fly, uh, which has a tolerance value of two and was collected in high abundance at the Pulpus Road site and the field station site. So the low tolerance value of this species could have skewed the data in the opposite way in that it's giving oddly low values. So really when we look at this Hills and Hoff Biotic Index, um, it's useful for Nantucket to run this, this sort of calculation, but you really have to consider the species that you're working with. Um, it's, it's a unique situation to say the least. I have not had these sort of uh, values in other areas that I've worked in. Um, but it, I mean, the Nantucket fauna is just so different. It's, it's really interesting how different it is. When, when com, uh, you know, uh, comparing the vineyard and Nantucket, it was interesting. So there's 137 species of macroinvertebrates um, that I found in 2008. I found an additional 20 in 2017. So we're talking about 157 compared to the possibly upwards of 70 on Nantucket. It makes sense that Nantucket would have a much smaller fauna. It's more isolated. There's far fewer streams and the streams are much smaller. There are, however, 26 species that are found on both islands. So all orders from the Martha's Vineyard fauna are represented on Nantucket by at least one species. So what am I gonna do with all this? Well, I've been relaying it to you, which has uh, been a good experience for me so far. Uh, the results are going to be published in transactions of the American Entomological Society Journal, which is uh, where I've published this sort of material in the past. And the specimens, as soon as I you know, get the publication in and I know I don't need them anymore, uh, they'll be stored at the Mar Mariah Mitchell Association on Nantucket. Now, if I had to make some recommendations based on this, you know, I go into areas and uh, you know, generate new information. Okay, so I've come up with a fauna that had never been recorded before. And we have some water quality data associated with that fauna. So based on that, are there any recommendations as far as to how to protect the fauna or as how maybe to monitor or you know, regulate the, the water on Nantucket? So we know that many species may be limited to individual streams and any such disturbance to a stream could result in a loss of biodiversity. So I would say that, and this is already being done uh, for most of these sites, not all, but most of them, that should definitely monitor stream chemistry on a yearly basis. Uh, potentially develop a biomonitoring program wherein streams are sampled you know, every three to five years or so, or more frequently if a stream chemistry issue arises. So if we find a particular site and you say, you know, something's not right, there's some sort of pollutant getting into this water, you could do a biomonitoring study over the course of a year or so and say, okay, is this actually affecting the fauna? Is the fauna telling us something about, you know, related to these, uh, you know, these uh, pollution issues that we're seeing? 
I would definitely recommend a stream length study of Phillips Run because of the high diversity and because of you know the fact that the biotic index value was high even after manipulation. So could there be a water quality issue? It's, it's certainly something worth exploring. I would definitely recommend sampling ponds and streams for more um, individuals of Calabetus floridanus because this is now an incredibly, incredibly, incredibly rare species in the state of Massachusetts. So we should learn as much as possible and find out, is it more abundant on the island or is it just a few individuals in that one stream? Uh, and if possible, sample more streams on Nantucket in order to determine if the low abundance species are actually more widely distributed than current data shows. You know, like I said, I could only look at so many sites and it would be great to know that, you know, uh, a number of these species that are so rare are actually more common. Um, it would really, uh, you know, make me feel a lot better about the thought of, you know, uh, just in case something were to happen that you would not necessarily lose a chunk of the biodiversity on the island. All right, so as far as who I would like to thank for this, um, Yvonne uh, has been incredibly, incredibly helpful and supportive throughout this project as far as getting me to Nantucket, providing equipment, helping with sampling. Um, I just cannot say enough nice things about how important she was to the success of this project. Uh, the UMass Boston Nantucket Field Station is just a fantastic resource for Nantucket. The researchers it brings in, um, providing these opportunities, providing this equipment, uh, cannot be understated at all. And uh, I am incredibly thankful that it exists and that I was able to work with the UMass Field Station on this project. Um, there were certainly some people that helped me out. Uh, Allison and Katie uh, were instrumental in sampling. I could not get there every month just logistically, especially during the summer. It would have been virtually impossible to compete with thousands and thousands of tourists uh, to get there and back. So they were a great help as far as sampling when I could not be there. Of course, this project was funded by the Nantucket Biodiversity Initiative Small Research Grants Program. So I am very much appreciative for them uh, for funding this project, allowing me to solve a 10 year mystery. And uh, thank you to my audience uh, for tuning in and uh, you know seeing what I've been up to for the last three years. Uh, as far as the literature cited, it is here. I know this is being recorded, so if anybody wanted to check out any of these resources, they are here for you. And open it up for any questions. All right. That was fantastic. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Um, I uh, will uh, hand over the question and answers over, over to Leo Stella, who is, is here um, joining us to facilitate that. Thanks, Yvonne, and, and thank you, Greg, for your presentation. We do have a question here from uh, Jack Looney. I'm going to patch in. Jack, if you unmute your mic, you're ready to go. Greg mentioned the mummy chogs usually found in marsh, which brings me to the question, is there any uh, a potential for um, uh, predator-prey relationships skewing your data? Yeah, so that is something that certainly should be looked into. Um, I did not find any, uh, any definitive links between uh, you know, a particular, let's say, lack of a species or an effect on overall abundance in the few sites where fish were present. Uh, but it would be really interesting if someone were to walk, for example, the Millbrook site with, uh, you know, uh, an electroshocker and see how common these fish are in the site. Uh, we only found a couple, but, you know, we certainly weren't sampling for them. And they were rather small individuals, but they certainly could be, uh, you know, picking off uh, certain, you know, certain species if they were targeting. Now, one thing that was really interesting is this, this isopod sea communist is supposed to be particularly susceptible to fish predation, but the, uh, you know, the Millbrook site had mummachogs and had ample amounts of isopods. So would that number have been even higher, uh, you know, without the fish presence? Uh, it's certainly possible. So it would be a really good study for someone to go through and see, you know, are there other fish hiding in some of these sites, particularly the three uh, perennial sites, uh, you know, to say the least, 
uh, I think it would be you know, really worthwhile. Thank, thanks. Thank you. Great, we've got one in the question and answer here from Rudy. You mentioned Phillips run goes by milestone. Do you suspect that road runoff is causing the lower quality? And did you see any temporal evolution of the quality with traffic patterns? So we actually sampled prior to the road. Um, so I, I, did not, uh, I did not even actually view the stream on the other side. So as, as far as road runoff is concerned, um, the concerns, you know, the traditional concerns in New England uh, would be, you know, small amounts of petroleum products. Uh, Nantucket does not get a lot of, uh, you know, snow to say the least. So sand and salt influxes, uh, which would be a huge concern elsewhere in New, in New England, are, are not really a question on Nantucket. Um, so I guess I'd like to say it would be a good comparison to do that study, to um, do a comparison of, you know, one side of the road compared to the next and see what happens after that road cut. Uh, you know, it would certainly be worthwhile to say the least. Um, you know, I don't know as, as far as accessibility um, exactly where it is. I can picture it in my mind on the map where it cuts under, where it pops back out, uh, but it would be interesting. I, as far as the water quality issue, the fact that it dries up um, doesn't help. It lends itself more to having those species which have higher tolerance values because just having that higher tolerance value, it, you know, it just makes you a tougher individual. Um, so those tend to have you know, higher values because they're in a temporary environment. The fact that it's completely lacking any sort of canopy cover um, and the temperature got surprisingly high in there, several degrees above any other site, was another factor in why we would have, um, you know, a higher value also. Uh, but it's, it's something that should be looked into. I would say that the issue, um, you know, should we look upstream? Should we start at the pond and work our way down? Uh, you know, I don't really, you know, can't necessarily say exactly where it is, uh, but it's something I would recommend looking into further. Great. Thanks, Greg. Anyone else um, in our uh, attendee section have questions? I'll take that as a no. Yvonne, do you have questions you'd like to pose? I do. Um... I always have a couple. Um, it, so seasonal trends, did you notice? And, and so I, I'll step back a moment. Um, the small scale of the stream sounds like it makes it really difficult to answer some of these questions like the one I just asked about seasonality. Um, so could you talk about that a little bit and also um, do you think this uh, occurrence of something that you normally see much further south, if, if you were to start seeing it a lot, do you think that is probable because of rising temperatures? So is that a climate change range thing or is it, I mean, uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll ask one question at a time. <laughs> All right, as, as far as seasonality is concerned, you absolutely see um, patterns of seasonality. So, for example, the black flies are a perfect example of that. You don't start seeing black fly larvae until typically January, February, March. Um, the black flies emerge and they're gone. So you only see them for that very short window of time. Uh, some of the groups like, uh, you know, damselflies, they'll take many, many months. So I'll start seeing uh, damselfly larvae showing up in October for an emergence the next, you know, May, June. So uh, there's definitely, uh, you know, e every group has its, its time to shine in the streams. Some of them are winter groups and uh, some of them are spring groups. Some of them will be larvae for just a couple months and some of them may exist as larvae for a couple years in the streams. It really just depends on their, their life history. Um, but again, because, you know, the, the, like you said, the fauna is so, so limited uh, that, and in Nantucket is so mild um, compared to where I typically see these groups 
that the larval presence does tend to be extended on Nantucket when you compare it to mainland populations of the same species in that, uh, you know, these, these rather moderate temperatures and mild winters, um, it's not as rushed. They don't have those very quick temperature fluctuations uh, that we see, uh, you know, elsewhere in New England. So, uh, you know, they can just kind of take their time, I guess, overall. Uh, so, you know, it, yeah, and it's, that's really the same trend that I saw on the vineyard too, where I, I called it, a, you know, extended seasonal larval presence, where they just seem to be present in the streams much longer than I would expect in other areas, because they have that, that opportunity, you know, their environment does not change that quickly around them. Um, as far as the, uh, you know, as, as far as the, the mayfly, now this is something that is, be <clears throat> it's becoming more common to see southern groups um, in northern states. And there's a couple schools of thoughts, um, one of which is that um, researchers are just getting better at identifying and they're actually starting to consider and more look for these more southerly species in northern states and they're kind of extending these ranges a bit more northward but that does not really go for the islands because it goes back to this uh, you know higher temperature uh, that we have in these very mild winters so these are species where they're in a habitat and their winters are very similar to what they're seeing a couple hundred miles south and they just kind of happen to have made their way up the coast at some point in the past and they exist in these very small fragile communities um, there was a dragonfly on the vineyard uh, that i found which is, it was the exact same story uh, the genus changed it was it was tetragonia spinosa I, I think it changed to epitheca spinosa i'd have to check uh, but it wasn't supposed to occur north of new jersey but it occurs in Millbrook on the vineyard. And again, it's there because just of you know, the mild winters. Um, but there's another way to think of it. Are we going to see these trends? And yes, we have seen a bit of this northwood, uh, northward progression of some of these groups that can exist uh, you know, and th these would be like extreme northern ranges when we look at something like Nantucket, the Cape and the Vineyard. Um, and, you know, long term trend next 10, 20, 30, 40 years, will we see an increase? Uh, you know, that would be an interesting study to say the least. And this is the sort of project that's important for those sort of studies because now you have the, the, the baseline documentation. So now you have a starting point. Thanks, Greg. We do have another question from our audience from Mark Palmer. The question is, did you have any comments on water quality in, uh, forgive me, Madiket, specifically the ditch, and signs of any outflows from the landfill? Uh, no, I, I didn't see any obvious water quality issues. So things that I would be looking for, uh, number one is algae blooms. And I didn't see that anywhere. Um, which was which was a great sign. So if I were to see that, I'd immediately okay. Let's check our nitrogen and phosphorus levels. Um, let's check our pH levels. And it's not something um, that was noted. I didn't see anything, you know, out of spec in you know in like I said, a developed area. Um, you know, either visually um, there were no odors I would associate. There was no scum on top of the water. Um, there were sensitive species at least a few at every site um, that would not have been present if there was, you know, outflow from any sort of landfill. Um, but if that is, you know, if there is a, a question, you know, and these are the, the sort of things that, uh, you know, make for great future studies. Um, you know, if there is a particular section of flowing water that borders an area where you're there is a concern about outflow, that's a great, you know, great area to set up a, a small study and sample it, uh, you know, for two, three months and see you know, is there a, uh, a, a difference in the fauna between, for example, my site, ver you know, one of my sites versus this site, or are we only seeing uh, species with extraordinary high tolerance values and no sensitive species whatsoever? So um, that is certainly is a future consideration if there are pinpoint sites that uh, people have concerns about. Great. Um, well, we've got time for one more question if um, someone from the audience wants to take it or if Yvonne has another one or a closing comment, Greg. Any, any last chance for questions. 
I can always come up with a couple more questions. <laughs> um, but what I think I would ask is, uh, as Leo did, uh, what would you do next if, um, if you were coming back down here? Would you search for more streams or would you focus on, would you repeat using the same streams or would you focus on a couple and more extensively sample the length of them? I know you spoke about that a little bit, but yep. um, did you have other, other closing comments? So I, I think uh, a biomonitoring program would be great. They're, they're easy to set up. Um, it doesn't have to be, I mean, you can, you can, you can run, a, run a program where you sample streams every five years, give or take. Um, it's not a huge cost involved. It's, it's easy field work to say the least. Um, the processing of the samples takes a long time to, you know, and you need a, a special, someone like me who just has endless piles of keys and textbooks and, you know, keeps up with the current taxonomy to identify. But the, the programs themselves are easy. Um, they're very beneficial. It allows you to look for long-term trends. So I definitely think that, um, you know, that would be a great thing. But if I were to come back to Nantucket, I would like to um, check out some more sites um, because I'm seeing this just rarity of so many of these species. Now, they're not rare Overall, you know, if we look at their their range throughout, you know, throughout uh, northeastern North America, they're not rare individuals. They're just rare on Nantucket. Um, so, is that really the case? Or if we looked at more sites, would we find that hey, you know, there's actually quite a bit in these sites that just were not accessible at that time? Um, so, a few more sites would be great, particularly if we could. If there was anything worth checking out in like the um, the southwestern part of the island where there really was no representation of uh, of collection, and uh, I'd say a definite priority would be to definitely look for more of that particular mayfly, and uh, you know just maybe a, a a stream long study just to see if it's more common. Um, is there a huge concentration in the uh, you know in the pond that is the source of Phillips Run? Uh, that would be really interesting to know because, I mean, you have to consider the implications of a species only existing in two towns in extremely small amounts. I mean, you could consider that to be an endangered species in the state of Massachusetts at this point. Well, it leaves us with an awful lot to think about and mm -hmm. um, to plan for. It, it would be really great to, to do what you're talking about. Um, Thank you so much. Uh, this was really interesting and it, clearly a lot of work. <laughs> um, so we thank you for taking the time to talk to us about this. Um, and we thank all the attendees for listening. I think it's, uh, it's really an interesting um, bunch of information and it's in our backyard. So uh, for me, it's really a treat to hear all the details. And thank you, Leo, for facilitating our questions. Um, I think uh, we're about out of time. Um, so thanks everyone. And um, we'll see you uh, with the next one, which will be announced when we, we offer our last spring seminar uh, from the Nantucket Field Station. Thank you. All right, thank you for having me. Thanks, Greg. Have a nice night, everybody. Good night, everyone.